Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this Zoom press conference this morning. My name is Mallory Carroll. Um, joining you, uh, formerly Mallory Quigley from Susan B. Anthony List. So this is my first um, press event um, using my married name. Um, we're so pleased that you could join us for this press conference with Governor Nome. Um, Lieutenant Governor Yvette and um, Attorney General Daniel Cameron. We're here to discuss the growing pro-life momentum at the state level ahead of the anniversary of Roe versus Wade this week and the annual March for Life, which is taking place on this Friday. So I'm gonna um, ask uh, Marjorie in a minute to um, give some remarks and to, she'll be introducing our speakers and turning to them as we go. There'll be a short, opportunity for Q&A at the end of the press conference. Um, if you have questions and you, during the remarks, please email me um, so that we can uh, get that in the queue. Um, but without further ado, I'll turn it over to Marjorie Danifelser, the president of Susan B. Anthony List. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, Mrs. Carroll, very much. And welcome everybody. Um, and, uh, and welcome our statewide um, leaders from across the country, governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general, all represent key parts of leadership in the future building consensus. And we, um, I refer to that in the context of the March for Life happening this week, which we hope draws attention to how big this year is um, in the media. And it certainly will continue to among activists across the country, hundreds of thousands focused and gathering um, to come to uh, DC to March, even in the middle of COVID, um, we'll be doing so uh, uh, this Friday. Uh, but one, the, this March is different from any other. <clears throat> it started in 1974, the, the year after Roe versus Wade, uh, and objecting to the um, long arm of the Supreme Court, reaching in and taking away every right for any, um, uh, for the will of the people reflected in their public officials um, to make its way into the law, reflecting the morals and the, and the commitments and the, uh, the heart of the people in each state. So as we come into this year, looking at the, uh, the, the Supreme Court case uh, out of Mississippi, the 15 week limit, the Dobbs case that should be considered late June, perhaps, perhaps early July. Uh, the court there, of course, will ask one question only they've agreed to uh, ask, that they've agreed to answer. And that is, is any pre-viability limit on abortion constitutional? That very narrow question, if answered in the affirmative, will either destroy or perhaps dismantle Roe versus Wade, which clears the way for one thing. And that's for state leaders like the ones you see now to be building consensus, um, listening to, and then building consensus among their citizens, which is exactly the way the founders foresaw our, um, uh, how, we, how we work out um, differences of opinion and deep moral issues that are churning at the heart of the country. So this would be an unfolding of democracy if the Supreme Court allows. Uh, the, the importance of um, the Lieutenant Governor, the Governor and AG here and your various roles cannot be overstated for the future. Each of these three uh, leaders has already been at work uh, building consensus, um, attending to the needs of women uh, in preparation for that, and is already charting the course even without that allowance from the court. So you can see that these three are ready to go and, have, and are, are, are way ahead of the game. And that's why we asked them to join us today. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to introduce first Governor Nome, um, who got up earlier than any of us uh, in South Dakota. Uh, to join us and give us a sense of what you're seeing in your state, the leadership that you've already stepped up and provided. You've done so much on a variety of levels. Um, if, you, if, uh, if you miss any of the things, I will remind <laughs> how you've led in so many ways, uh, but you have put this as a first priority in your state and we're incredibly proud of you. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, well, thank you, Marjorie, and thank you to Susan B. Anthony for allowing me to be a part of this press conference and to continue to talk about something that I'm incredibly passionate about. Uh, this week is a big week uh, in Washington, D.C., when tens of thousands of people will show up to express their deep love appreciation for life and life in the womb and the fact that they believe that Roe v. Wade should be overturned and that the momentum we see at the Supreme Court 
is encouraging. I had the opportunity in past years when I served in Congress to go down to the mall and speak at the gatherings at March for Life and was always very involved in these issues while I was on Capitol Hill. But when I talked about becoming governor of South Dakota and when I started out in my campaign conveying to the people here in our state what kind of governor I wanted to be, the very first priority that I laid out for them was that I wanted to be the most pro-life governor in the country. Um, and I said that as soon as I got elected, that I would uh, put someone in my governor's office to be named as a pro-life advocate, an unborn child advocate that would get up every single day as a part of their job description and look for ways to protect life. They would do it through pushing legislation and bills and giving me suggestions, do it through arguing case law, or what we could even be a part of at the national level to help build momentum to really open up people's hearts and open up their minds to really the truth that science has backed now more and more, uh, more now than ever, uh, that this life really is uh, started at conception. Uh, so that unborn child advocate is a part of my administration and we have been extremely aggressive here in South Dakota making sure that we're working on issues that continue to resonate in the hearts of people who live here, but also use it as an opportunity to educate other people that maybe don't understand what science is proving and what it is, how this is a constitutionally protected life in the womb. You know, the Dobbs case is coming, and I know that the Supreme Court has already heard oral arguments. I was a part of 240 women that wrote a friend of the court brief on this case to be heard in front of the Supreme Court. And our argument was pushing back against a lot of what this case was impacted by, which was the message uh, that was used uh, in Casey and then also in Roe v. Wade uh, determination and consequences was that a woman could not be a mother and be successful at the same time. This friend of the court brief that we wrote um, pushed back on that and declared that that absolutely was not true. We told our personal stories, uh, the stories of the fact that we can pursue our dreams and our careers as well as still be mothers and live out the incredible opportunities that we have in both of those roles. Proud to be a part of that case. And one of the things that we see as this comes forward and we'll be seeing a decision come out of the Supreme Court is that if this case does not fundamentally dismantle Roe v. Wade, we do have an opportunity for a case that will be heard shortly thereafter, which is called uh, Planned Parenthood versus Nome. It is the South Dakota case that has been in court for many years, and it is to be the next pro-life case that would be in front of the Supreme Court. I'm proud to be fighting this fight for the unborn lives that are out there and really looking forward to continuing to make that argument to our highest court in the land to see Roe v. Wade torn down. Um, beyond that, in South Dakota, we've been continuing to work on, on these issues and policy. Uh, every year we bring legislation. Every year we work on administrative rules and, and different uh, opportunities that we have to protect life. Last year, one of my biggest bills uh, that we championed was protecting children so they couldn't be aborted uh, upon a diagnosis of Down syndrome. We believe every single life has value and children uh, that do have a genetic um, condition such as Down syndrome should not be discriminated against and uh, aborted because of that diagnosis. That was passed overwhelmingly. In fact, it proved that pro-life issues do not need to be divisive. Unanimous support in my legislature, Republicans and Democrats all joined together and passed that legislation into our state law, proving that it doesn't have to be divisive. Uh, that every voice ha or every voice, every life has value. And that bill was incredibly important to us to show that, that this conversation can be had and that people can be educated on the importance of, of life in the womb. Uh, we did eight pro-life bills here in South Dakota last year. This year, I have two that I'm bringing to build on that. And one of them is to ban telemedicine abortions here in the state of South Dakota. Uh, these chemical abortions are very dangerous for a woman. In fact, a woman is four times more likely to end up in an emergency room uh, using a chemical abortion in this way over the phone or over the internet. And we want to make sure that we are protecting the women here in South Dakota and protecting lives at the same time by making sure that a woman can, and a, or a child cannot get on the phone or get on the internet, purchase chemical drugs, get sent to their home, and then do this procedure in their bathroom with no medical supervision whatsoever. It's not safe, it's not 
um, a good situation that we want our children to be growing up in with that kind of access to those dangerous drugs. The second bill that I'm bringing is a heartbeat bill. And it's a bill that would make sure that a life was protected among the moment it, a heartbeat can be detected. Uh, that that life, uh, as soon as that heartbeat is, is detected uh, throughout this pregnancy, that at that moment in time, there is not the ability to have an abortion here in the state of South Dakota. It's built on and modeled and we've cooperated with those who crafted the Texas law. Uh, and we are incredibly grateful for their help, but we also believe it's a strong bill because we have addressed some of the uh, other concerns that have been brought to us about its ability to withstand a court challenge. And we're grateful that the people of South Dakota are showing a lot of support for this legislation. And I'm hopeful that my legislature will see the value in passing it and putting it into law here in South Dakota. Uh, we've been so grateful for the, the legal team that has stepped up and helped us with our Supreme Court case that's also giving us advice on our pro-life legislation. Uh, Jay Seculo has been fantastic in agreeing to help us argue that Supreme Court case. We're so grateful for that. He is a well-respected uh, legal advisor and has been for many years. And I think having that kind of talent and, and wisdom uh, on our side of these arguments will help us gain the momentum that we need to truly protect every single life that is impacted by Roe v. Wade here in this country. So thank you, Marjorie, for giving me the chance to to work with you, I consider it a great honor each and every day to call you a friend um, because you recognize that every single person in this country, whether in the womb or outside of the womb has value and, and that we should be working every day to change policy that literally does save lives. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you and look forward to hearing from the other speakers at the press conference. Thank you, Governor, I feel the same way. It's a moment of great, to be a great united front at, this, mm -hmm. at the, um, uh, as we approach the court and we approach this new day, um, how united we are will be a predictor of how successful we are in saving lives. So thank you so much. Lieutenant Governor uh, Pamela Evett, I met you on the steps of a maternity home in South Carolina, um, highlighting the seriousness with which you take the moment in terms of how we serve the needs of women and children um, when children are born and the lives that they will lead after they're born. So um, I, I also wanted to highlight in this call um, how important the role of Lieutenant Governor is and will be in helping form consensus in a state and working that consensus through the state legislature. So thank you so much for joining us. Marjorie, thank you so much. I mean, it's an honor to be here. What a rock star panel, Governor Nome, uh, AG Cameron. I'm excited to share this stage with you. And, and Marjorie, thank you to Susan B. Anthony List and how much you have done and the fight you've made uh, over the years to get us to where we are now. I'm incredibly proud to be the Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina. We had a big year last year. Um, you know, the well, governor likes to say elections have consequences. And for us, they were good. We turned over two Senate seats last year. Those were very pro-life senators that were brought in. And so S1 was able to pass. Uh, S1, I think it's, it really uh, talks about what we stand for here in South Carolina. The very first thing we thought to protect here in South Carolina was life. Uh, and without life, nothing else matters. And so I was proud to stand with our governor. Governor McMaster has been fighting for life for a lot of years. And we have such great pro-life groups here in our state. Uh, Citizens for Lies, Lisa Van Riper and Holly, uh, Holly Gatling have been doing so much over the years, um, just championing. You know, Roe v. Wade uh, kind of sent everything in a spiral here. We saw record numbers of abortions uh, when Roe v. Wade passed. But through the years, we have done uh, taken steps every year, and we could see the downturn in abortion. Uh, we're very excited uh, for the Dobbs case to be heard in the Supreme Court. And here in South Carolina, what we've been doing is trying to set ourselves up for what will happen, because we are, again, very hopeful that we will now look uh, at the humanity of what we should have been doing for years of that, uh, that child in the womb. And so the governor has put together uh, an adoption summit. Uh, and we have brought in stakeholders from across the state. We've brought in pro-life advocates. We have brought in our faith community because the governor likes to say that here in South Carolina, you know, we have a six foot bed and a four foot blanket. And if it's not <laughs> for, the, for the faith community to come in and fill that gap, we don't know what we would do. And so we rely on them heavily. 
Uh, Palmetto family has done such a great job on these adoption summits. And what we're trying to do here in South Carolina uh, is make the option for adoption easier, right? We have heard from people that have wanted to adopt. Uh, some people have told me that it could take almost a year's salary for them to go through the adoption process, and that's not what we want. You know, the pushback I heard, you know, being a woman and uh, Governor Nome, thank you for all you do. I mean, we, we get uh, some, some definitely different opinions from the people who sit across from us on this issue because we're women, right? I have heard over and over again that all I care about is infants in the room and that we don't care about the mothers and the infants once they're um, here on earth with us. And that couldn't be any, uh, any less true, right? We, that's why we are putting this together. We wanna make sure that we're prepared, that we are giving mothers who find themselves in a situation they didn't count on a very soft landing pad. And we wanna be here to help. We know our faith community will play a huge part along with our pro-life groups. We'll be changing focus uh, once Roe v. Wade gets dismantled. And what we wanna do is bring in our partners that are already here. So many people don't realize of the great pregnancy centers we have across our state. Uh, I make it a point, as does the governor, that when we are traveling the state, if we come into a city that has a pregnancy center, um, we go to it. Our free clinics offer amazing services, um, but our pregnancy centers are there. They're there to help and guide in whatever route a mother wants to go, whether it's to keep her baby um, and help get through that process. They do so many things from trying to find resources for them to job placement. If they find themselves that they're not in a situation they feel they can financially take care of a child, how do we get their skill levels up so they feel comfortable uh, in the journey they're about to embark on? Uh, our pregnancy centers do all that. Uh, if they have existing children, they actually help them with those children, providing goods and needs and uh, you know, helping them along the way. And so kudos to them. And what we want to do is get that message out better. You know, last year uh, in 2020, there were 5,468 abortions here in South Carolina, lives lost. Uh, statistics say that two thirds of those, as Governor Nome pointed out, were chemically induced abortions, very dangerous to women. Uh, as you said, Governor Nome, going home with these dangerous drugs and being there alone is not quality women's health. You know, we've heard over the years that this issue is a woman's health issue, and it couldn't be further from the truth, because if you were, if you really cared about women, you wouldn't allow them to embark on this very dangerous journey alone at home, uh, most of the time scared and young. Uh, what that means for South Carolina is that there was 1,823 abortions that were done procedurally. So potentially that's what we look as the impact to our state, uh, young moms and children that we will have to help. And here in South Carolina, we are standing ready to do that. Uh, and we will continue to find ways uh, to help our moms. The governor, uh, like I said, has done so many great things uh, here in our state to give adoption a good option. Uh, we are working like I said, with Palmetto family and our faith community uh, to change the messaging on why adoption is a beautiful thing. Uh, and whether you find yourself young and alone and scared, uh, how can we help you get through this process, uh, put the child that you may not have wanted into a loving, caring family um, so that you can feel good about the decision you made. And I think if we can change the narrative on that, or if you find yourself in a situation, uh, as Governor Nome said, where we're protecting um, babies that are not yet born, whose parents may be afraid of a diagnosis, right? We have to let them know that it is okay to bring that baby into the world. And you are no less of a person if you choose to do that and give it up for adoption where a family can do that. And I can say that with 100% certainty because in my family, I have a cousin who just adopted a baby um, that has a chromosomal issue whose parents are great parents and existing parents, but knew that that was more than they could take on as a couple. And what a beautiful gift. Uh, they had lost a baby um, and were feeling incredibly saddened, but willing to take on the challenges that a child like that could bring. So to, 
you know, we need to change the narrative. We need to make people feel better about the fact that they are good people. Uh, and it's okay when something is over what you can take. So, um, Marjorie, I look forward to what's happening at the Supreme Court. Uh, I will be helping and cheering on. I think here in, in South Carolina, we're seeing more young women join our ranks. And I think that's so very important. Uh, I think because of women standing up, women that are well-respected like Governor Nome, it gives them the strength um, to be able to stand up and say, listen, I am proudly pro-life and it is okay. And I think that we can do better. Uh, and I'm just so happy that we'll be able to change this because I fear what future generations will think about us if we don't. Uh, so with that, I, I'm gonna turn it back to you. And again, thank you for uh, the tireless fight that you along with everybody else puts up. And now I am here to fight it alongside uh, with you and with all of our great partners across the state. Thank you so much. <clears throat> it's a beautiful uh, coalition and uh, you and Governor Nome are mission central in terms of Susan B. Anthony Ellis uh, initial and first mission, um, which is about women and representing women. Um, Attorney General Daniel Cameron, um, we're really thrilled to have you. The role of Attorney General um, can't be understated either when it comes to certainly now, <laughs> but also in the future when there will be ambitious laws on the books uh, that the attorney general in each state uh, will still be um, emboldened to, uh, to defend all the way. And you have fought for that right to defend uh, in divided government, under divided government in Kentucky, um, the, to defend the laws that your legislature has, uh, has passed. And I think we met on the steps of the Kentucky Capitol when you were uh, just before being elected and our canvassers were very proud to go all across the state advocating for you and so happy that we did because your leadership is a banner uh, for other AGs across the country. And uh, I know they join me in saying that, I've heard it many times. Um, so thank you for joining us and um, let's hear from you and then we'll uh, have some questions after that. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, Marjorie. And obviously it was, uh, uh, important moment when I got to meet you and obviously we're able to connect with Susan B. Anthony List and uh, Governor Nome, thank you for the work that you've been doing and Lieutenant Governor Vett, I appreciate uh, what you're doing uh, in South Carolina. I'm a big fan of your Attorney General, uh, Alan Wilson, who has been a, a dear friend of mine and, and somebody I know whose heart is in these issues as well. So thank you, Marjorie, again, for allowing me to join you today and as we start uh, this week to the 2022 March for Life. Uh, what is happening today and what will happen uh, in the days to come are possible because of what you all are doing at Susan B. Anthony List and so many pro-life advocates across this country. Uh, so thanks to everyone as well that's watching and uh, Marjorie, special thanks to you and your team for just the amazing work that has gone into this week. Now I'm talking to you all from uh, my office at home and not in Frankfurt, uh, and I'm doing so because uh, a few days ago, uh, my wife, Mackenzie, uh, gave birth to our son, Theodore J. Cameron. Uh, he's been a wonderful blessing. And uh, yes, we, we certainly had our sleep patterns interrupted, uh, but this is a uh, amazing time for us as a family. Uh, and all those problems go away when I see him nestled on uh, Mackenzie's shoulder. Uh, he has just been a really special blessing. Uh, now, seeing Theodore in these first few weeks has been wonderful, but it also brings to mind what we know in this nine-month journey that is behind us now. Our first glimpses of us came through a pregnancy test, uh, and then we heard his heartbeat, uh, and then ultimately the ultrasounds. It all reminds us of why this cause is so important. You know, it's been 49 years uh, since Roe v. Wade, and 49 years since abortion has been the law of the land. Uh, but today is a different day. Today, attorneys general, governors, state legislators are all uh, in the business of wanting to protect the unborn. And last October, my office stood in front of the U nine justices of the United States Supreme Court and advocated for our right uh, to defend a pro-life abortion law. In our case, the law at issue could not have been more important. It bans the practice of live dismemberment abortion. Uh, so we look forward to the Supreme Court's decision uh, and we are hopeful that we're going to be able to continue to defend this pro-life law in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. 
Along with many of you, as has already been noted, we wait with great anticipation for the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs. Uh, that decision uh, could have monumental impact on whether abortion remains a law of the land. And just like Mississippi argued in Dobbs, here in Kentucky, our pro-life legislation represents the values of Kentuckians. And it's the job of attorneys generals to see that such laws make sure they get a strong defense in court. But that's why in Kentucky, we're currently defending the heartbeat law uh, that makes sure that if a fetal heartbeat is detected, that there cannot be an abortion. Uh, we're also making sure that there's a, dis no dis no, there's a ban on discriminatory practices as it relates to abortion. So there are so many things that we're doing in Kentucky and there's so much reason to hope I know you all have experienced that reason to hope, whether it's the March for Life or whether it's the kids that you see that are showing up for the march or the science that now makes it easier uh, to see a child in the womb and, and harder to end a pregnancy. Um, it has been an amazing journey in these last 49 years to get us to this point uh, and hope that uh, the Dobbs decision will come out in such a way that upholds and values and respects the sanctity of life. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, we had some pretty devastating tornadoes hit the central and western parts of our state. Because of it, uh, I felt compelled to go uh, down to those regions and help out. So I wasn't able to go to uh, a pro-life gathering that was happening here in my hometown of Louisville, but my wife Mackenzie went and she actually spoke on my behalf and I assure you uh, that they got the better end of that bargain. Uh, but one of the things that she said uh, came out of Jeremiah 1.5, and she recited uh, the whole uh, verse, but I'll just say the part that, that stuck with me as I was thinking about what I'd say today uh, was that even in the womb, uh, the Lord knew us and set us apart. And I think as uh, image bearers of Christ, folks that care deeply about those that are in the womb, uh, what better way uh, to protect and, and value life uh, than to be a part of a mission that allows for the God-given potential uh, of, of kids or babies that are in the womb uh, to be fully expressed here in this earth. So I'm excited to be a part of that mission. I know all of you all that are uh, watching and listening today are excited to be a part of this mission as well. Uh, I'm grateful uh, again to Susan B. Anthony List for the work that you've done uh, to uh, get us to this point, to get us at the, the, the doorstep, if you will, of this Dobbs decision. And obviously, Governor No mentioned a, a case that she has that uh, it will be coming uh, soon hereafter. So thank you again for giving me a, a brief moment to, to speak and for showing me a little grace from, from doing this as, at home as well. Thank you so much. And congratulations. We're so excited for your family. Thank you. Can't wait to meet that guy. Yeah. Um, Mallory, do we have questions from our friends in the media? We do, Marjorie. Um, the first question is from Jennifer Haberhorn at the Los Angeles Times. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, Obviously, the focus is on the Dobbs uh, case today, but Texas's case is also in the courts. Given the controversy around the Texas law, I'm wondering if you can speak to whether that's a conscious choice. I mean, do you guys view the Texas law at this point as a, as a, a kind of lost cause? Um, thanks for taking the question. I'm going to let I'm going to ask Governor Nome to uh, address this question. I, I would I would uh, preface it by just saying that. It was born of frustration uh, of never allowing any for 49 years limit on abortion um, make its way into the law. Um, and so that's why uh, I, I think it's it's likely not a lost cause because frankly, it's it's on the books today. Now, we don't know what it'll look like after Dobbs, but we do know uh, that there's more than one way to, to um, more than one way to do this. So uh, Governor Nome, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think we all celebrated seeing Texas pass this law because we knew that immediately lives would be saved. Um, and But also in working with those who drafted that bill and looking at the possibility of doing so here in South Dakota, we care very much about policy. We care very much about the laws that go into place, but we also care that they can withstand a court challenge as well. Uh, so we do have some changes to our bill as 
drafted and as filed and will be debated during our legislative session that started last week uh, that will bring the, the spirit and the protections of the Texas law, protecting a life at the moment that you detect that heartbeat, uh, but also some changes in how it's enforced and what the ramifications of that are. So what this does is not really insert the state in between that relationship with the doctor and the woman, but another party could go forward and go uh, and pursue litigation in that instance from a private side individual uh, into a doctor against a doctor that would perform that abortion. So we believe in working with national mm -hmm. legal minds and scholars and those who have worked in Texas and are very, very familiar with the argument that's being made down there, that South Dakota's law will be strong, that it will save lives from the moment it's put into place, but that it will withstand a court challenge as well. And the ramifications for which we considered as well, how it would impact our Supreme Court arguments as well was a big part of this discussion. We did not want to do anything that would hurt the momentum that we're feeling at the Supreme Court. So looking at the Dobbs case, looking at the Planned Parenthood versus Nome case that would follow, we wanted to ensure that those would still have strong arguments that could be made that we think give us the best chance to overturn Roe v. Wade, but also make sure that this argument that we're making here in South Dakota, should it be challenged on the heartbeat law, uh, would not pull away from that, but actually enhance that debate and bring another element to the courts that really would give us the protections that we need to make long-term systemic change here in the United States. Attorney General Cameron, do you have thoughts on this topic? Well, um, you know, I certainly think that um, the, the focus of a lot of time and attention right now is on the Dobbs case, and that'll certainly impact, as Governor No mentioned, you know, how all uh, law and policy as it relates to abortion and, and the pro-life movement uh, will go forward. So I, I'll await to see what happens in the Dobbs case, and that will inform uh, some of these policies uh, moving forward. And I'll note again that, you know, here in Kentucky, we've got the, the fetal heartbeat bill that we are currently defending and the uh, ban on discriminatory practices as it relates to abortion. Uh, so, you know, those are, Kate, those are issues that have been front and center in our General Assembly. Uh, I think get, seeing what happens in the Dobbs case will have some impact, uh, perhaps on what our General Assembly will ultimately do in the future. Uh, but I appreciate what, what Texas has, has uh, tried to do. And uh, we'll, I know our folks here in our in General Assembly are, are, are watching with uh, bated breath to see how that plays out and how it plays out in light of Dobbs. Thank you. We have another question from um, Patrick Hoff from the Free Beacon. Patrick, go ahead and ask your question. I can hear me. Yes. Right. Yeah, thanks for... Uh, let me ask a question here. Uh, just on the topic of chemical abortion pills, which I know we discussed real briefly, just wondering what sort of action states are looking to take on that and whether or not it will address uh, the illegal chemical abortion pills that are sold on websites like Plan C and, and companies like Aid Access. Thanks. Lieutenant Governor, I'm going to go to you first since uh, uh, you weren't in on the, on the other one, but if uh, on the other question, but if, you, if you're interested in answering that, great. And then we'll go to the uh, governor. Um, well, thank you so much, Marjorie. And thank you for that question. You know, as I said earlier, something that we're all very concerned about because this is a woman's health issue. And it's even more scary to think that these drugs are bought online um, and that what could happen uh, when taken alone, taken by yourself, taken if something goes wrong. Um, and so that is something that we're working on here is how do we you know, how do we stop that? How does that fit in? When we signed the heartbeat bill last year, it was almost immediately challenged. And so just um, like the attorney general said, we're waiting to see what's gonna happen um, with the Dobbs case. And we're hoping that that will help uh, move forward our heartbeat bill. Um, but it's something that, this necess that does have to be addressed. It's very necessary. Uh, as I stated earlier, two thirds of the abortions that were done here in South Carolina in 2020 um, were chemical abortions. And we just feel that that is an extreme health risk for our citizens. I know that the um, governor had to go, we promised 30 minutes and we're over 10 minutes. So she took us at our word. I did want to mention, however, that she just signed a very strong executive order um, related to chemical abortion and all aspects that, um, that she has the power to do so in, um, uh, on the state level. 
and um, we can refer any reporters to that who would like to take a closer look. Um, maybe Mallory, we are at, at um, 1040. Mm -hmm. Is there, would you want to shoot for one more question? It, it's looking like um, we're not having any more questions. Okay. Thank you to everybody for um, tuning in. Um, if you do have questions and want to follow up with any of our speakers after this, feel free to email me. My email is still the same, mquigley at sbalist.org. Um, and we're uh, very thankful to Lieutenant Governor and Attorney General for joining us and of course, Governor Noem. Um, do you want to close this out, Marjorie? Yeah, I would just also thank the people of your states for electing you, for having the foresight to elect you um, and the leaders of the pro-life movement in your states uh, making sure that everyone in their states knew what you're made of because you're made for such a time as this, I believe. And uh, we have got important work ahead of us and I couldn't be more proud to be working closely with you and the, and the uh, folks back home. So thank you so much. And we'll be talking again soon, I know. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone. Mm-hmm. <laughs>